Welcome to Blue Politics. Uh, I've seen you on the server before, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, start off with uh, first question. Uh, what video are you most proud of? And that's from Lil Bill. Um, I mean, probably it would be, I think that the, the so-called socialism done short videos are really nice. They try to explain like a socialist concept, which usually people will explain by saying, hey, read this book. And they try and explain it instead in like two minutes. Um, I try and put like what socialism means, for example, into like six or eight words or so. Um, so I think I'm most proud of that because I think it has the most ability to like educate people or share my ideas, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. That's the take there. Oh, brilliant. Um, we've uh, we've uh, plugged your YouTube channel as well. For those people who, um, who want to check it out, you can see at the top of uh, the socialism done left uh, <laughs> tech channel. Um, and another one from uh, Lil Bill. What are your thoughts around Andrew Yang's NYC uh, mayoral run? Um, I mean, so when Andrew Yang ran for president in general, uh, his UBI, I think I think UBI is a good policy. It solves um, a poverty problem that is called cashlessness. So even if we imagine that we fulfill everyone's needs via so-called like universal basic needs, um, some people still don't have cash, and so it's very hard for them to do everyday transactions. UBI does solve that, and it solves it in a very administratively efficient way. It's better to do something like UBI than to do a whole bunch of complicated tax credits. Um, it, it's a simple program um, with obvious benefits. Um, but uh, as far as I'm aware, his New York campaign doesn't seem to be very promising. And the other main flaw of Yang's UBI in particular um, was that um, it basically would replace welfare, which would have actually been net regressive for the poor because it would have given more money to the rich while giving no additional money to the poor. And it would have been paid for with additional taxes, which would have impacted the poor. Um, so I don't think that that in particular is a good policy, but in general, he's probably like a reasonably good progressive candidate. I don't know the other candidates, so I can't really compare him though. Okay, cool. Um, since you just touched on UBI, question from uh, Mr. Tom. You've mm -hmm. said uh, you said already that you think UBI uh, is a net regressive for poorer people because it doesn't give them any extra money. Um, Tom asks, what are your thoughts on UBI? Oh, so UBI in general isn't necessarily regressive. It's Yang's UBI in particular, which is that it, in particular, how it would have uh, worked is it would have been funded with a consumption tax, which is regressive because poor people, can, their consumption is more as a percent of their income than rich people. Because um, if you think about it, like the cost of you know food, the cost of housing and so on, are they don't increase as quickly as your income does. Um, and so it, generally consumption taxes tend to tax the poor more. That's not necessarily a problem um, if you're, like the net result of the money that you're using from that consumption tax is to benefit the poor disproportionately. Because it's a universal basic income, in Yang's vision, it is a flat benefit, but a regressive tax. So the net effect is regressive. But if it's a progressive benefit um, and a regressive tax, it's possible it cancels out or even is net progressive. Um, so that's the, the basic idea there. Um, in particular with Yang, it's because it would replace welfare, but it wouldn't replace it with like a much larger welfare program. I do, like I said, I actually do like the idea of UBI because it does solve um, two main problems, which, it, which is administrative difficulty. Uh, like a lot of the cash programs we have now, you have to like file for um, either with a separate program or you have to go through like a whole tax program for it, which has the two problems of one, requiring a lot of administrative overhead, which doesn't, it's not efficient. That's a waste of money. Um, and two, uh, it means that a lot of people don't get it. Um, and they often get it in the wrong year. Like they they don't get it because they don't apply, they can't get the benefits. They don't actually meet the requirements for the benefits. Or if it's tax benefits, rather than getting it in the year that you're poor, you get it the next year. It'll be so much better to get like monthly or weekly lump sum payments. Um, which you could very easily do with a UBI style program rather than a so-called negative income tax program. Okay, thank you. Um, next question from Rel. Does centrism bring real change? Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to quite answer that. I suppose centrism in any country is exactly equivalent to the status quo, so no. Um, I, I guess in general, like the I would say that the center has tended to shift left over time due to like a variety of demographic trends, like rising education, um, rising incomes, which seem to have made people get in, um, seems to have enabled like the modern welfare state, seems to have enabled a lot of the modern like regulation and unionization that we see. Um, so I, sure, yes, maybe. Uh, context dependent then on which country you would say. I guess. Okay, cool. Um, next question from Tan. What healthcare structure do you think will be the best for the current American climate? 
uh, like political climate? I guess maybe I should ask them. Uh, it, but he's he's asked uh, things like Medicare for all, public option, Biden Care, uh, resurrection of Obamacare. Which, which one would you think uh, would suit the the people most? I mean, the policy that I think would be optimal is something like Medicare for all, or even further, um, something like the beverage style model. Um, so, like the basic summary for those who aren't aware is. Um, you've got something like the United States, which is like a mixture. It's multi-payer, and most people pay privately um, through like employer insurance or like private insurance markets. And then some people are paid with like government programs. There's a step to the left, which is like a public option, where the state would provide a free or highly subsidized insurance option or set of options, um, basically enabling everyone to get it regardless of their job status or income. Um, that'd be more like something like the programs in Germany, from what I understand it. Then you go even a step further, and you get to like single payer, which is something akin to like Canada. Uh, as I understand it, um, which um, it's a single payer, meaning that the government has basically become all of the insurance programs. It's, if you want an analogy, the government is now a gigantic HMO, health uh, management organization. Um, it is now the entire insurer, but it is not the employer of the doctors. And finally, the, fi like the final step would be um, the beverage model or the Samashko model. Beverage model is like what the, the UK does. It's basically similar to what the Nordic models do. do. And the Samashko model was a similar sort of model done in the USSR, where in addition to the state being the HMO, the only insurer, the state is also the only employer of doctors. So rather than just paying for your bills, they're also employing the doctors um, who are in charge of them. And that is where it gets much, much closer to an HMO uh, rather than just a big insurance firm. Um, because then they, they, they pay for the incentives both on the one end of wanting to pay for your health care, but also wanting to give you um, cheap and like minimal health care services. So there's we have a lot of evidence in like the United States that HMOs tend to save money. Um, it seems like those models are reasonably uh, like pre pretty cheap. The UK has pretty cheap healthcare for its like GDP. Um, it seems like they're reasonably high quality. Um, I generally advocate for that one um, because I think it is the most likely to deliver healthcare to everyone as a right. Uh, the UK is for you know there, people will critique the UK and it's not you know perfect on everything. But in general, the UK is the country which has the greatest access to healthcare of any country in the world. I think the stat is that in the United States, about one third of people report being unable to access, for example, um, pharmaceuticals. Um, in the UK, it's 2%. Um, and in healthcare in general, I think it's like 50% of the United States and like 5% of the UK. It's the lowest of any country in the world. So I think it comes the closest to genuinely providing everyone uh, healthcare, which I think is necessary to live a good life, necessary to participate in democracy, and necessary also to like be a productive citizen. Um, that's the take there. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Angus. Can social democracy be considered a path to socialism uh, under developed countries? So I am a reformist socialist, and I think therefore the answer is yes. I think that um, there's a gradient between um, more capitalist systems and more socialist systems. And so if socialism, if the basic summary of socialism is economic democracy, um, which broadly means that like we come closer to like one person, one vote and like community control of um, the economy over rather than like just market or just wealth control. Um, then social democracies tend to, unlike the three big things that I talk about, um, they tend to have more worker control. Generally, they have much stronger unionization. They have generally um, stronger cooperatives uh, and they have generally have stronger like co-determination, like worker management, um, even in firms um, that are union or not unionized. Um, so like Iceland, for example, has like 99% union coverage. Um, France has like 98% union coverage. Um, union membership is also very high in like a lot of the good SOC Dem countries. Uh, and so that means more worker power. It means more ability to control the economy, which necessarily shifts power towards like the average person and away from centralized um, rich people, basically. Um, the second that I usually talk about is um, what I call like economic democracy. Uh, basically the idea that... Um, the people as a whole need to be able to like determine what the economy is working towards, like setting its goals. And again, in these societies, we often see very large state intervention. Like Sweden spends, I think, 50% of its GDP um, via taxation. Um, and so you have a lot of programs. For example, Finland has a really exceptional program um, called Housing First, um, which has is working towards the more or less elimination of um, what people call like uh, like rough homelessness, sleeping on the street sort of stuff. Um, basically, by providing everyone a house of um they're they're like what the, the main things that usually people don't get a house for are like if they have they don't have a job or they're a drug addict housing first just gives everyone a house and so these sorts of interventions seem not only to benefit the individuals but society as a whole um and so 
uh, there it seems like um, increasingly these countries have moved away from letting the market determine, hey, should you get a house or not? Um, and increasingly moved towards just deciding, yes, we should provide everyone a house. So I would call that closer to economic democracy. Um, and it's also a much fairer system and better for everyone. And finally, it would be something like very low inequality. And there's mixed measures on this one. So Sweden has pretty high wealth inequality because there's one really rich family that owns like a fifth of the country. <laughs> um, most of the Nordic countries have relatively better wealth inequality and much, much, much better income inequality. And that seems to reduce the conflict between the classes. And eventually, um, I call this goal like class compression. The goal is to lift up the poor and pull down the rich to a sufficient degree that everyone is fundamentally the same class. Um, if you want to use Marxist terms, it would be the self-abolition of the proletariat. Uh, basically by making everyone into the proletariat. There's no, there's no bourgeois anymore, and there's no like poor beneath you anymore. Everyone is a worker, um, and so there's no more class conflict. So basically, I think that we've seen steps towards all of these things um, in these countries, and we can certainly at least use these countries as evidence that moving in this direction um, doesn't seem to cause major harms. If, if anything, it seems to cause major benefits, like people having full housing, which seems like a really nice outcome. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um Next question comes from player 10. Uh, he's asking, what kinds of theories uh, slash books should people read uh, if they're new to lefty ideologies and isms? So um, I guess some like layman friendly, like relatively simpler books um, would be, one is called The People's Republic of Walmart. Um, the basic argument of the People's Republic of Walmart is that internally, most firms are centrally planned. Um, Amazon does not have like an, an internal market of where to decide where goods go. It's all ultimately determined by a computer, which is trying to maximize um, Amazon's profit. Um, so the suggestion, the very simple suggestion of the book is, hey, if companies can do it, why can't the government? So I am not a supporter of central planning as a whole. Um, I'm a supporter of like a market socialism. And so the counterpart book that I would recommend, The People's Republic of Walmart, um, is like the the, the, argue, the the very simple layman friendly um, argument for central planning and the somewhat more technical argument for a mixture uh, of, of market and state, um, something closer to what I call, uh, not I call, the, the concept is called um, uh, oh. The developmental state, um, where the state plays an active role in trying to make markets more efficient and um, to like improve them beyond. Basically, uh, it, the, the idea is that in a lot of Western countries, we have a regulatory state where we like limit the bads of the market, um, but also this the idea of the developmental state, which is part of what we think is like part of the insane success story of like the East Asian countries is that the state intervened and actually made the markets more efficient uh, by coordinating production, coordinating patents, and so on. Um, and so... Um, the argument there would be raised by the book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, The Entrepreneurial State by Mariana Matsukudo. And you can find all of these uh, for free on b-ok.org. Okay, fantastic. Um, next question comes from American legend, uh, guns, where do you stand on them? So um, because I'm a reformist, I don't want like some big revolution. I don't think it would win. Um, and so I just don't think that's feasible. So the remaining questions for guns are um, one, do they like protect political freedom, like political democracy? Uh, two, do they protect individuals um, fundamentally? And so the second one is very easy to answer because we have an enormous amount of studies on this. It seems like countries, locations, um, cities, whatever, that have more guns seem to have more crime. And there's a reasonable amount of evidence that, that, that this is causal. Um, we have evidence, for example, that after a waiting period was imposed in the 1990 uh, assault weapon ban, there was a waiting period imposed on handguns of a week, I believe. And after it, there was a, a significant like 13% reduction in crime that can be attributed to that. Um, uh, I can post some of these studies, I guess, if people want to read them. But um, there, similarly, we have a lot of evidence that guns seem to also causally, again, increase um, suicide. So like there's a, a neat but small sample size study um, of Israeli soldiers. So Israel banned uh, I don't know if it was all soldiers, but at least these soldiers from banning, um, banned them to, from taking their guns home on the weekend. And there was a 40% reduction of suicide among Israeli soldiers. Um, and then the entirety of that reduction was during the weekend. Um, the weekday suicide rate was unchanged. Uh, there's similar, again, hot, like reasonably high quality causal evidence that guns seem to increase suicide. Uh, and then finally, we have little evidence that guns seem to help with self-defense. Um, there's, there's, 
basically, um, it, the most reasonable belief is that guns are maybe involved in about 1% of crimes as possibly being involved in self-defense. If, even if you want to call it 2%, it's very hard to think that the, um, this has a major uh, like self-defense effect. So even if, you, even if you say, hey, maybe guns increase crime, maybe guns increase homicide, well, people have a right to self-defense. It doesn't seem like guns really achieve that very much. The best self-defense is fundamentally having lower crime rates, um, ultimately. And so it doesn't seem like they fulfill those. So on the personal side, I, and you know, this is a whole enormous debate. There's a huge literature here, and I'm sure that people can disagree with me. Um, but I think the evidence enormously weighs in favor of guns being like a harm to an individual. The qu only question then is, can guns like preserve freedom? And all of the evidence that I've read thus far suggests that um, more firearms does not seem to protect countries against um, reductions in freedom. Um, like there's no correlation between firearms and increases or reductions in freedom of a few freedom indices. Um, and um, in general, uh, the book, if you want another book to read here um, that I, I refer to often is called The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Resistance, um, which is basically, it, it's a big book about a data set that a few um, sociologists, uh, I guess history, I don't know what, they, what their specific field is, um, but like a sort of combination of history and sociology um, that they made about nonviolent resistance. And the short summary of it is that nonviolent resistance seems to be much more effective, like two to three times more effective than violent resistance. And that trend is increasing over time. Um, so uh, because guns in particular and violence in general doesn't seem to be the best way to protect people's freedoms, I don't know that it's a strong argument for keeping guns. Um, however, I would say that my short-term pro pro proposals are generally pretty limited. I just want to do stuff like, hey, I want to mandate gun safes, that if you have a gun, you've got to have a gun safe because the number one way criminals get guns is stealing them. Um, you can enormously reduce that with, the gun, with gun safes um, and gun licenses, gun permits, so that you can know who has what gun and making sure they have a safe, basically. Um, the, that and trying to reduce the manufacture of guns, basically trying to curb the trend in the very long term, those are the main things that I actually advocate for. Okay, thank you. Um Next question comes from Angel13 Mima. It's a classic question, pro-life or pro-choice? Um, so my answer to this one is, I think right now, um, you ha I think that you have an obligation to be pro-choice. Um, but I think that as you get closer to a socialist society where people truly have freedom over their reproductive decisions, um, then you would eventually have to become closer to pro-life. Uh, the idea here is that if contraception is free, if like birth control is free, um, if um, if all of these like technology that we're talking about are free and easily accessed, if people are high education, um, and if there's like a large welfare state and a highly functioning like orphan basically um, care system, uh, which there is very much not in like the status quo, then I think the the moral argument does shift in favor of believing that after a certain point, um, you do have an obligation to carry the kid to term because you aren't facing significant consequences for something which ultimately was under your control. Um, and that kid being carried to term won't significantly negatively impact their life, um, which that you could have a possible argument now due to like the extreme difficulties of the um, orphanage system in the United States and around the world. Um, so I think that as you get closer to like a truly generous welfare state model, it does get closer to like a pro-life system. However, I think that the classic cutoff, which is like, um, like, cut, like cutting off at like two trimesters, um, very few um, babies are, are, are aborted after that time period. It's like it's something like 97% of abortions occur before the third trimester. Uh, no, that's not even true. It's 97 before the second trimester. Um, so the amount of abortion restriction we're talking about here um, is probably very small. Like pro-life here probably means restricting it after like say the, the first or like somewhere in the second trimester. And again, you're just not talking about very many abortions. So the actual effect of something like this is not that large. Uh, okay. That's my thing. Thank you. Uh, Mike Escape wants to know: Would you rather fight a lion or a cheetah? <laughs> what? Uh, it's a common question from him. He always wants to know. Uh, good man. Um, I don't know, lion. I feel like if I could pose with it afterwards, I get a lot more clout. <laughs> true. True. Um, and I, of course, I win, right? Like, how could I lose? A soy boy like <laughs> me could never lose a debate with a, a fight with a lion. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Um, next question comes from probably Tim. Oh. Assuming that you agree both were bad, which was worse, Stalin or Trotsky? Uh, I mean, so I guess the, the fundamental difference is that Stalin... Um, 
seemed so Trotsky, I think, was closer to an ideologue than Stalin, which might sound odd, but Stalin changed a lot of his positions over time. His biggest pursuit seemed to be of like political power. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure that had Trotsky achieved control, his policies would have been much better or much worse than those of Stalin. But I think that he, there was a greater chance that Trotsky might have preserved what little democracy remained in the Soviet Union around the 1922 period, um, because his goal was not to like, accumulate power and exterminate enemies. It was mostly to implement his like pretty extreme radical socialist program, um, which did not necessarily require the suppression of people um, at the political level that Stalin's did. Um, so I guess probably Stalin, um, but that's actually a complicated one. It's sort of like a what if thing. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, another both question. were pretty hard there, just to be clear. Like both the Trotsky did a whole lot of atrocities during the Civil War. Um, yeah. As far as I'm aware. Again, next question from Rel. Uh, does equal opportunity result in equal outcomes? Uh, no. Due to a combination of luck and other differences, uh, no, it doesn't. Um, some, this is something literally uh, fucking Marx said. Um, there will always be differences between individuals, um, uh, but just based on like strength. Uh, but, you know, it, there's some biological differences in intelligence, some biological differences in like how well you work in certain workplaces. There's luck involved in some of these things. You happen to get like in the right workplace, um, but I think that uh, tr achieving true equality of opportunity, which we are nowhere close to in the United States, um, like when you look at the wealth that people are born with, um, it's so incredibly different across like different socioeconomic backgrounds. That to say that everyone starts at the same place is just simply absurd. If you got closer to it, equality of opportunity would also be constrained. So like as you constrain differences in equality of opportunity so that everyone has roughly the same opportunity, you would also see a reduction of like qual of equality of, of outcome. Generally, I say that um, as a socialist, I want meritocracy, which means equality of um, opportunity um, in general. And the exceptions to that are where you want equality of, of outcome because it improves society. So. Uh, meritocracy generally improves efficiency because people who are better at doing something, doing something probably helps everyone out because it saves resources. It like helps improve the productive efficiency of the economy that promotes long-term growth. That's good. Um, then sometimes you want to promote a quality of outcome, even if it like reduces that the first sense of economic efficiency because it promotes another uh, economic efficiency that benefits even more. So the concept I promoted before was in housing. Um, if you give everyone a house, um, which is a quality of outcome, right? You're giving everyone a house, no matter how well they're doing or how poorly they're doing. It seems that it reduces crime, it reduces social spending, it generally benefits everyone in society. Um, so that sort of thing also benefits society, not through necessarily the productive efficiency, but through minimizing um, other harms that like uh, poverty causes basically on society. So a combination of economic, um, sorry, a combination of a quality of outcome where it's economically efficient and a quality of opportunity where it's economically efficient, I think is the best advocacy. Okay, thank you. Um, next question comes from Italix. Uh, you've been talking a lot about kind of compressing the wealth of the country so the gap between the poorest and the richest gets smaller. He says, the top 1% of income earners in the United States have 40% of the country's wealth, as a, uh, according to the Federal Reserve. What is the highest acceptable proportion of the wealth for the 1% to own, in your opinion? Um, that's a good question. I don't have a number for you. So I'm I'll right out just say I don't have a number. Um, if we want to look to historical examples of very equal societies, um, like the, the Sweden in the 1970s, which was under a, a, a social democratic program that was gearing up to try and start shifting everything over to worker ownership. Um, the top 1% there had 4% of, of the income. Um, I don't know what percent of the wealth they had. So I can't I don't know that offhand. Um, and in the USSR, again, which radically um, had, had a whole bunch of radical equality, mostly due to uh, equal wages um, rather than necessarily like redistribution. Um, again, it was about 4% given to the top 1%. So it seems like we've already been to at least that point. So a 10 times reduction might be about on order of what we're talking about. Um, I think the top 1% currently gets 25% of the income in the United States. Um, so if you want to go from top 1% gets 25 to 4%, that would be a, a good first step. I don't know what the long-term efficient uh, number is there. Um, Okay, Doris, yeah. thank you. Uh, great answer. Uh, next question comes from uh, Dev. They're talking a lot about the Nordic countries as models to be uh, reform, uh, reform the United States and uh, to be emulated. Uh, he says, as a Nordic myself, um, I want to hear your certain supposed downsides of even the Nordic model, as the Nordic model is often 
uh, homogeneous in terms of its mm-hmm. society. Uh, how would a nation that is not had uh, can't say this word homogeneous, such as the United States, be able to have a harmonious first step uh, in order to start to achieve the Nordic model? So I know I'm not trying to paint you as a conservative. This is a common conservative talking point. Um, one of the things that seems to be interesting is that it's true, but not for the reasons that people think. Um, there's a very famous paper from uh, that was published in Enberg, the National Bureau of Economic Research, which I can try and go find, which strongly suggests that one of the reasons that white people in particular don't like welfare is because um, they fear that the welfare is going to non-white people. They, they particularly see it as like black welfare queen sort of thing. And so um, one of the main theories for why the United States has this weaker welfare state than it's otherwise generally pretty comparable um, uh, European countries is in fact due to racial um, heterogeneity, but it's not be- it's not like the heterogeneity that caused it. It's rather that racism plus heterogeneity caused it. The way to think about it is in the United States, if you're racist, um, you 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 might also hate the poor because the poor are of a different race than you. If you're racist in Norway in like in like 1960 or something, you don't hate the poor because the poor are the same race as you. And so it it means that um, in the United States, racism has been like aligned with anti-welfare measures, whereas in like a lot of the Nordic countries, it has not been aligned. I think that part of what you're seeing right now in Europe is the realignment with racism with a whole new political movement because there has been an increase in diversity into these countries. Um, I think that's part of the story for why you've seen the rise of the far right. Um, the solution for how you solve this um, is twofold, I think. Um, there's a really neat article. Oh, I can try and find this one as well. Um, I believe the title was something like uh, Trust Before Streets versus Streets Before Trust, which sounds odd. The basic question is, do you need to build trust in public institutions before you give people like public programs? Or can you use public programs to build trust? And one of the things that we know is that income inequality is the biggest predictor of low trust. Um, like. Uh, there's there's a whole literature on whether um, heterogeneity reduces trust, and it seems like it does, but it, only an extremely small amount. You're talking something like a 10% increase of heterogeneity is like a 0.1% like increase in distrust. The main predictor seems to be income inequality and poverty um, are the main reasons people distrust each other. Um, so I think that the idea that I'm promoting is basically um, public programs to will in fact create this trust that you're talking about. Um, so that's the one suggestion there. And then at a more base level, how do you try and reduce the distrust based on like um, ethnic uh, heterogeneity? Uh, the basic theory here is contact hypothesis. We know that people who have more experience with people who are diverse from them, um, like whether it be religion or race or whatever, tend to be substantially more tolerant of those people. Um, so diverse communities and not in like segregated communities seems to enormously reduce um, bigoted beliefs. So ideally, you'd want like a high mixture of communities um, in the United States, which we just don't have. Um, The United States has seen decreasing segregation over time, but it's still relatively segregated. Um, I think that's also probably partly to explain I think you are seeing the the I think you're seeing the cur- the beginning of the down curve of the populist movement in Europe, um, but where it's stronger, I think part of that can be explained by lack of sufficient contact to make people who were once alien to you less alien. Um, so, uh, in short, I guess my response is I think one uh, build trust through programs um, to reduce the the base causes of tr- of distrust. I, I'm also a big advocate of like community organizations. If you want yet another book, it would be um, Politics is for Power. Politics is for Power by Hirsch, which strongly advocates for the role of uh, union uh, institutions that used to be like unions um, or churches um, or even like local sports leagues have all kind of fallen apart. Um, for a variety of reasons, recreating something like that, even if it's with like state funds or something, you have like instead of instead of paying NPR, you're paying like your local sports league with government funds. You're paying your local um, news journalism with government funds. Um, these sorts of things can rebuild community trust. Uh, and then the other answer is contact hypothesis. It's it, it's trying to reduce segregation and produce integrated communities. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, mm-hmm. Next question comes from Tim Spinal Cord. Uh, in your opinion, who is the best advocate for socialism in history? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I would say um, the the economic position that I hold is either something like revisionist Marxism or post-left Keynesianism, which I know they're big terms. But um, so I don't know that I'm really going to agree with anyone per se. Maybe I think some of the most interesting um, examples of how to actually do socialism in the modern time. Um, came from, I would say, Meidner. Meidner in the Swedish Swedish Social Democrats proposed the Meidner Plan, which was an idea to take public, to take, basically take control of businesses and transfer it from, um, 
you know, if you want to call them capitalists, right, the bourgeois, transfer it over to the workers, basically by mandating that companies slowly transfer their stocks over to unions. Um, he also was hugely influenced in the solidarity wage program in Sweden and a whole bunch of other policies therein. Um, and so I think that would be a great example of like 1960s, like, so, like reformist advocacy, I guess. Um, a modern person, if you want someone to follow on Twitter, I guess, would be Matt Brunig, who does sort of similar arguments for the United States. Um, and I guess if you wanted an even older one, if you want, if you want like a legitimate, uh, if, you know, if, if, if the only legitimate texts are written before 1900, right, a la Marx, um, maybe Edward Bernstein wrote Evolutionary Socialism in 1899. Um, he was also dumb in a lot of ways, but I think that uh, one of the basic ideas he proposes there in Evolutionary Socialism is that incremental steps towards socialism lets you build these institutions that are democratic. Um, so like, it lets, you know, if you want to like nationalize Amazon, great, but nationalizing it doesn't actually make it democratic, right? It just means that now the government's appointing who runs Amazon. Uh, one of his big contributions, I think, was to try and suggest that when you incrementally build out democracy, what you can do is incrementally do nationalization and then have that infrastructure be integrated into broader democracy. Um, which is also something that I think Paul Cockshot, which I know is a funny name, Paul Cockshot talks about a little bit. Um, those would be, I know I said four, but Meidner first, the rest are also extremely important in my mind anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, quit that Stalin. Uh, you were just, a uh, question from him, you were just talking about um, America and he wants to know, what are your thoughts on Amer American exceptionalism and how some people claim that American exceptionalism poses an obstacle to implementing leftist ideas in America? I think there's some truth to it. Um, so I don't take what's the, like the orthodox Marxist position of like material conditions being the ultimate determinant. I come closer to what's called like, if you've ever heard the term cultural Marxist, um, it's usually a boogeyman about um, the Frankfurt School. Uh, so the, the, the cultural Marxist or Frankfurt School approach is that culture is the bigger determinant of ideology and ideology is the bigger determinant of how society runs. It's not material conditions determine ideology, but rather to some degree that ideology determines material conditions. Um, so I think that the particular culture of the United States does um, very much lead it to have these particular material conditions. That's why I mentioned the study before about like um, heterogeneity plus racism leading to like a very weak welfare state. Um, you can also find just like, uh, there's, just, there's just lots of evidence that it seems like the, the culture that we have um, determines like the political structure we have. Like one of the things that's really interesting is, um, <laughs> or this was a recent article. Most Republicans don't know the economic policies of the Republican Party because nowadays, um, since the 80s, um, again, this is something that uh, in Politics Per Power, which I mentioned before by Hirsch, um, increasingly debates are about social issues, not economic ones. Like, in, I'm sorry, what people vote for is about is about social issues, not economic ones. Um, the term here is saliency. So um, social issues are now salient. People care about them and vote based on them. But economic issues have reduced saliency. And so the odd thing is that Democrats often have very popular economic positions, but economic positions aren't salient. People care about social issues. And on those, Democrats and Republicans are roughly 50-50 um, in general. Um, and so... Um, I think that culture and like, I know, I know American exceptionalism doesn't mean culture in general, but like American exceptionalism, the belief that the United States is really special is often like a religious fervor or even racial belief attached with it. Um, I think that is very harmful, um, because it leads to that sort of social importance, which seems to be hurting, um, uh, left-wing politics in the United States. Um, the example, if you want a recent one would be that, um, of like economic issues being salient and social not, I'm sorry, of economic issues being popular but not salient. Um, Donald Trump won Florida 53%, um, but in Florida also passed a $15 minimum wage, which is a policy that Biden is currently promoting in, in Congress. Um, and tr Donald Trump for reference wants zero minimum wage. That's what he prefers, zero dollars. Um, Biden is promoting this policy and yet um, he lost the state. Biden only got 47% of the vote and yet a $15 minimum wage referendum got, um, I wanna say it's 63% of the vote or something. It outperformed by like 15 or 20 points or so. Um, so I guess the basic take here is that I would like to see a more economically salient politics. And I think American exceptionalism harms that. Um, if you want the article, it's pretty neat. Um, it's, I think it's like something like 30% of Republicans think that their party's in favor of $15 minimum wage, which is clearly not true. Very interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, CEO of Cybernetics uh, has just said, you just mentioned uh, how you're against state-owned industry. Um, I've already heard that you... Uh, uh, in favor of democratically and work workplaces, but he wants to know uh, what your opinions are on the positives of them. 
Um, I'm sorry, the positives of state-owned or cooperative? Uh, cooperatives and uh, democratically owned workplaces. Oh, sure. So there's a there's a whole literature here on... So I think the simplest way to think about it can sometimes be in terms of incentives. Um, in a conventional workplace um, where, where there's no employee stock ownership and where there's no participation in management, you have no incentive fundamentally to actually work. It literally in, um, in economics, this is described as a, a agent principle problem. You want to put in the minimum possible effort at work um, <laughs> and get the maximum possible pay. Um, because you don't care how well the company does, except if they do so poorly that they stop paying you, or if they can figure out that you're sh that you're shirking and stop paying you. One of the fundamental differences um, that you get when you shift towards um, one worker management um, or worker involvement in management, which is like co-determination or worker self-determination, um, and two, like employee stock ownership, employee ownership of the company, is now you directly have incentives to help the company work. Because when the company does better, you do better. Now. It's not like the strongest incentive because the stocks aren't going to perform like a million percent better or a million percent worse, but it does align your incentives with those of the business. We, there's a decent amount of empirical evidence, particularly from a guy named, and I'll type this out because it's long too, Kugliagos, um, who I think he's done I think, like one or two meta studies on the productivity of cooperatives. Generally, it seems like cooperatives are more productive than con like comparable um, conventional firms, um, but... Um, Basically, they're, they're more productive, and the reason seems to be in part that there's more worker buy-in. Um, more workers are more willing to do the work that management wants them to do, um, and they're also more willing, uh, they, because they're participating in the management of the firm, they can add knowledge to that process, and they are more willing to actually follow through with that management rather than being managed from above. And if I get to give a final non-economic benefit, it's like, in classic Marxian terms, it's alienation. Um, there's a whole lot of evidence, and this one's even stronger than the economic evidence, a whole lot of evidence that worker in man management in um, in, in firms enormously reduces how alienated people feel from work. Um, people feel more connected with society and their coworkers and so on if they have an active role in managing their firms, if they have an active role in feeling like they have control over their economic life, which to me makes sense. It's a third of your fucking life, you know, maybe half of your waking life that you spend at work. Um, not having control of that sucks. It really fucking sucks. And so I, when I say that socialism is economic democracy, one of the basic ideas here is we would like the, 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 the work you do every day to truly be democratic in the way that, to some degree, your political life is. Um, that's the basic thing. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, another question from Tim Spinal Cord. What do you think is the hardest obstacle for socialism as a whole? Um, I mean, right now, I think it's the economic saliency and cultural saliency stuff. Um, like the, if you, if you want to look at, so I think of this in part in terms of electoral trends. So like in the long term, America, um, and I think it's really important that socialism wins in the first world because that's where all the money is. That's where all the power is. Um, it seems like every time socialism wins or social democracy even wins in the third world, it starts to get crushed down by the first world. Um, so you got to win in the first world. Well, what are the trends in the first world? People, it's people focusing on social issues and not focusing on, on like popular economic issues, especially in the United States. So the long-term trends in the United States are more education, as I was mentioning, more diverse communities, less racism. Um, a really promising stat is um, only one in ten um, Boomer Republicans um, think that uh, like systemic racism for Black people is a problem in this country. It's four in ten um, Generation Z Republicans. Um, so increasingly, I am hoping that we move towards it being less about social issues, actually, and more being about economic issues. But that's a long-term trend, and it's relying on education. In the short term, um, I'm worried that there's going to be a decline of democracy in the United States and in other countries due to the rise of populism. Um, and that that will prevent um, leftists from being able to recenter the conversation around economic issues and win electoral victories to implement those policies. Um, so I guess fundamentally the answer is culture. I'm worried that culture and the decline of economic saliency are going to sink the leftist project and sink the democratic project. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Dev. Is there a particular policy model of immigration that is the most ideal for a social democracy in your opinion? Uh, so one thing that's really interesting here is... Um, so almost all of the evidence suggests that immigration is a net benefit to like the, the destination country. Um, uh, 
it's it's it basically if you read almost any study other than written by a guy named George Borjas, the other like 95, 97 percent of the literature um, is going to support like immigration being a net benefit for the economy. The problem is that it has redistributional effects. Uh, much like a regressive tax, it seems like immigration tends to hurt uh, one other recent immigrants and two um, people who are like low education or low skill. And so those people tend to be poor and it really hurt. And like, we don't want to hurt people who are poor in general, um, both because of those poverty bad effects and also because of political bad effects. If people feel like immigration is hurting them, they're willing to vote for the right. Um, so the solution is you need some form of redistribution. If it benefits the economy, that means you've now got more money. You can take some of that money and redistribute it down to the people who are being harmed by this. Um, and if you do so, everyone should in fact be better off. Um, if, if it's net gain to the economy and you redistribute the gains to those who are hurting, um, you have necessarily made everyone better off. So how do you achieve that? The basic answer that I would like is something which um, something which matches like the immigration rate for a local community um, to like a sort of stipend for that community. Um, the basic, like you would be some, ugh. The analogy is sort of um, how do you solve gentrification? One of the ways that you solve it is you, by giving like local residents stakes in the wealth of that community and paying them dividends from the stakes of the wealth in that community. So as home prices go up, they get paid more even if they don't have equity. The same sort of sort of idea is underlying this idea of how you would deal with immigration. It's a benefit for you um, even if you're poor, but you need to make sure that people are actually getting paid like a dividend from some sort of like immigration, um, like wealth fund or something um, that is based on in part, like the increased earnings to the entire economy from immigrants. Um, so in short, I don't know, maybe something like the immigrant wealth fund pays a dividend to people who have been displaced by immigrant workers, um, or even more succinctly, you could just have an immigrant wealth fund, which paid money to the poor people who are now being supported by an enormous and lovely socialist welfare state. Okay. We cool. love our welfare state folks. We love it. Um, Another question from Tim. Uh, doesn't the incentive created by work ownership diminish the larger a company is? Yes. Um, the, the marginal effect of your work on the success of the company is smaller. I will note that, um, I, I guess it depends on how many stocks there are, so that's less of an issue. The, the work effect is smaller in a bigger company. Um, th this is actually... Um, this is also actually a problem in the agent principal problem I was mentioning before, because larger companies also have, usually have more difficulty monitoring workers, because instead of just being able to say a boss to directly monitor a worker, they need to monitor a worker who's in turn monitoring a worker who's monitoring a worker, there becomes even more of these agent principal problems. So this is not just like a problem with cooperatives. Um, the, these incentive problems are just problems with like firms in general. Um, so I don't think that's insubstantial. Um, I think one of the other big ideas is that in addition to have financial incentives, you also have like a kind of social incentive. If you are involved in the management of the company and you know these people, um, because often people form friendships through work, and if you're democratically involved in it, you're much more likely, again, to not feel alienated and to feel directly involved in that firm, then you basically feel like you're obligated to work with them. It's the same sort of, it's not as extreme, obviously, but people feel a similar dynamic in war. And I know that, that sounds somewhat absurd, but if you're all working for a common goal, you all are with each other constantly all the time, and you're constantly trying to engage and talk with how about how to do these sort of things, there's a um, camaraderie that you can sort of foster. And so a combination of like increased financial incentives, um, increased understanding of how like the workplace is managed, increased personal happiness, um, all these might help to make workers more efficient in a cooperative um, is the basic take. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Italics. Do you think economic or cultural salience, uh, the, the issues surrounded by that, are connected to manufactured consent? Uh, I, I do think that media has played a role in this. Um, there's a really neat study that um, like Fox News viewership is highly correlated in a causal way um, with increased voting Republican. So, um, uh, and similarly, there's a, a weaker effects, but in the opposite direction for watching MSNBC. Uh, so like media can change how people vote. It can change how people think. The, nobody should deny that. There's even fucking studies that op-eds, like writing an op-ed in your local newspaper will change the people who read it. It will change their minds. Um, but I think that the, the thesis that like Hirsch fundamentally raises in Politics is for Power is, and I agree with this from, from my own readings, as people have gotten high and high enough income, um, they have cared less and less about economic issues. And so they are what he calls post-materialist. After your material needs are basically satiated, you start to focus on things that have like a more of a personal or individual interest to you. And so this often tends to be social issues, um, which are like more niche and also are a lot more emotional, I think, is part of it. Um, because you aren't emotionally worried about like surviving day to day, but you are maybe emotionally worried about like people 
people, respecting your identity. Um, you know, that's, that's part of that why we talk about the culture wars. It's the culture of like people generally on the left who want like more acceptance of these certain identities and a culture of people who feel like a grievance, like uh, the, the new identities are eroding their, their identities um, or what's some often called cultural anxiety. There's lots of interesting research about cultural anxiety. Um, so I think that the main reason for it has to do with rising incomes and rising education um, driving these sort of things. We've seen the same trend in virtually every country that the left-wing parties have become the parties of the highly educated and have shifted away from economic policy towards social policy. Um, so the goal is basically to keep them as the parties of the highly educated, but also to adopt economic left policies. If I had to recommend one last thing to read here, it would be... Um, <laughs> it's an article by Matthew Iglesias called The Great Awakening, um, which is about the the very quick shift left on race issues among white liberal voters. Um, and it's really interesting. Okay. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested to check that out. The The title is quite funny. Um, another question from Lil Bill. Uh, will the New York's attorney general succeed in getting Trump in prison for tax fraud? I have no idea whether he'll succeed. I mean, I hope he does, um, if there is substance there. Um, I don't know. I haven't reviewed the, any of the Trump, like, I, was it like 4, 17 million or something? I haven't reviewed any of that in an extremely long time, like half a year or something. It feels like it all faded away due to the pandemic. Um, yeah. But... Um, if there's substance there, if it is true that Trump abused the tax system to get like an excessively large um, tax write-off, or I don't know if it's a tax credit or tax write-off, either of those seems like it's probably abusive. I don't know whether it's just Trump in particular or whether it's meet like like large corporations or rich individuals in general. Um, I don't, you know, I, I you know I don't like Trump because of the effects he's had on the political system, but I don't want to just like attack him because he's like the the big conservative figurehead, and we want to tear him down. I think there's a much more interesting long term trend of um, the rate at which the IRS uh, like looks into rich individuals has been stopped like dropping dramatically. I think the stat is that back in like 1990, it was like 12 percent of people making over a million dollars a year got audited. Nowadays, it's like one percent, which is the same portion of people who make less than twenty thousand dollars a year, you know, poverty line um, that are getting audited. So it's incredibly low. So I think the bigger problem is that if this this shouldn't have been allowed to fester for like 12 years, it should have been the sort of thing they were getting back immediately after it happened um, by constantly auditing like people who make higher incomes. Um, uh, basically, it seems like there's a reason it, it's probable that there's a whole lot of tax evasion and somewhat not necessarily like illegal, but like uh, gray uh, evasion of the tax system that's going on that isn't being audited at the current moment. Um, oh, sorry, Mr. Tom. No, it's fine. Um, thank you. Uh, oh, just, I thought Mr. Tom's uh, microphone lit up for a moment. That's all. Uh, a, a lot of people who've been asking about the recent takedown of um Trump on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the popular um, popular social media. What do you think about that? Uh, so I have mixed thoughts, actually. So I think that because Trump, de facto, to my mind, promoted political violence, um, it is acceptable to remove someone. Like that's that's if we if by any reasonable standards of like who should be able to communicate, that is outside the bounds. Um, even if it's not direct incitement, it's very clear. It's like one step removed at best. Um, and so I think that that clearly would, were he like a private citizen, clearly motivated. As a public official, it might be useful to have him have some official capacity to release statements. But something that I mentioned is I almost pref would prefer, yeah, I guess, I, I don't know that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to answer Tim's question a little bit in more detail, I don't know that Trump in particular um, was like the, the the driving incitement, like he was the only reason the Capitol riots happened. I'm not trying to say that. I think he contributed to it and contributing to something like that is sufficient to get you off of a platform like this. Um, in the same way that even if you, you know, like we kick out ISIS recruiters from Twitter all the time, that's obviously more extreme. Um, but um, we do so not because we know that they're gonna lead to political violence, but because their actions reasonably could lead to political violence. And so I think it is reasonable in that respect. On the other hand, Trump is a public figure. I don't. I do want public figures to have a, an ability to speak. I don't want them to be silenced by big corporations. But if I had to, the, one of the problems with Trump in particular is that it seems like when he actually has his media team prepare him a statement, it's like fifty nine, like to seventy percent more calmly collected than the kind of shit he puts out on Twitter. So I would almost prefer that, just for sanity's sake, that he was forced to actually make like not not make nonsensical statements and go through his like press release and actually talk to the press. Uh, so I I don't know. In this particular case, I think it's probably bad. In
in the long term, if you wanted a more general answer, I think that publicly funded like media and some degree of like public ownership of these platforms um, would help to establish better norms about what is and what is not allowed, rather than basically leaving it up to you know Jack Dorsey to decide when too much is too much. Um, which for Jack Dorsey is probably when ad advertisers stop stop giving them money because they're worried about the Twitter image. Um, so, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, another question from CEO of Cybernetics. Would you support Bernie's policy on creating publicly owned broadband networks? Oh, of course. It's one of the so um, there's a term called natural monopoly, and it's it's the idea that um, for certain types of it might be more efficient for one firm to run that entire industry because the cost of duplicating all of the infrastructure involved, usually this is the reason why, the cost of duplicating all the infrastructure involved is so prohibitively expensive that um, other firms just won't enter and so there won't be competition. And so um, you're either going to have very weak competition or um, no competition at all. And so uh, laying down fiber optic cables seems to be the sort of thing where it's cheaper to lay it down once. Um, it's the sort of thing where a natural monopoly sort of makes sense. One of the problems is that right now, there are often by law even natural monopolies or duopolies um, in various like communities around the United States. And that seems to lead to very poor coverage for those communities. There's a whole neat study, I think I, I can pull it up, um, that uh, community fiber optics is substantially cheaper than conventional um, fiber optic uh, lines in like the in the places where it's implemented. It's like cheaper and higher quality, um, and so it's the sort of thing that the state is naturally inclined to do to run this sort of thing. Um, because a natural monopoly that you give to a firm, the firm wants to make profit. The natural monopoly that you give to the state, um, I guess you know, it could want to run the profit if that's what the people who set it up do. But if you like, uh, pro in particular, when I talk about nationalized firms, I want what's called like a people's nationalization. Rather than just having the state own it, you also want it to be democratically managed, so people have a say in, in running it. When you have that, then the incentives of the democratically managed, uh, like state-owned firm, are to serve the community much more closely than a private firm, which fundamentally just wants to make money off its monopoly status. Um, so yeah, good. Love it. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Time time for two more questions or do you want to go on for a bit more? Uh, why don't we do two more? That sounds fine. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Uh, another question from Dev. Uh, which Nordic country did, uh, did it the best as of continuing social welfare that is trusted? So I don't know about trust. Um, I, I don't have data. I don't have offhand data on which uh, system is the most trusted. Um, and one of the other relevant questions is: Is it possible that there will be there's a significant short term decline in trust due to like immigration because of the contact hypothesis that people who are alien to you all of a sudden come in, and then there's again the term I mentioned before is cultural anxiety. Um, they they come in, they're scary, they're foreign, um, and it like causes anxiety. People shift to the right because they're afraid of the newcomers. Um, and I think that what you'd want, um, I, I saw the huge context, by the way, um, Dansk. Um, so like, I, I saw all of that. Um, the, 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 the basic question is what's like the steady state level of trust. Um, and I would assume it's the one which provides like, I, I would assume it's the one which tends to be more, um, universal and flat sort of, um, distributional programs, which I, I want to say that's more like Iceland or Finland, but I'm not sure offhand. Um. There's a really neat study on that one called um, More Normal Than Welfare, which strongly suggests that programs like universal basic income, or we can imagine like a universal welfare program where you know we just send out everyone food stamps or something, um, which would be you know expensive, but it's also the, the general idea. Um, when you have universal programs, people are not discriminated against for being in those programs. So in addition to the benefits of reducing inequality and therefore improving trust, it also seems like you reduce distrust of people in welfare by having it be universal and therefore everyone gets it um, and everyone knows someone who gets it. And so they have that sort of contact there to understand um, it's not so scary after all. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question. Um from Tan. Are there any aspects of the USSR or China, whether economical, social, or political, that you consider desirable or worthy of replication in the United States? So I mentioned before um, the developmental state. One of the big things that the developmental state can do is super long-term investment um, and like investing in capital to like drive up the rate of growth in the economy. Um, and this is something that was present in both the USSR and China, and also like in South Korea and Japan and uh, Vietnam and Thailand and Taiwan. Uh, it's not just the socialist thing, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Just having a state which actively involves itself in the economy is not necessarily even just an authoritarian thing either, even though a lot of these countries were authoritarian when they were doing it. 
Um, the basic good thing that is part of this model is trying to have the state coordinate innovation and production between firms in a way which allows you to maximize long-term growth. So like a, a simple example, which is like very, very simple from the USSR is that they wanted to produce more tractors in the future, um, <laughs> which famously led to the, the, the undersupply of tractors was actually a huge deal for the Holodomor and the killing of the, the, the death, I guess, of like 6 million or so people um, in the USSR. So undersupply of tractors was a really big issue. I can't say that they did it perfectly, but they wanted to build more tractors. And so the market, had it just say, has seen, hey, the demand for tractors went up, would have only like, in, it would have had sent the signal back to steel by increasing the price for, you know, first it's tractor parts, then it's the increase for like the, the factories for tractor parks, and then it's for steel. Um, instead, because of the central planning, they could start the steel production increase several years beforehand. Um, similarly, for stuff like, like planning for population explosions or future immigration, you can produce housing before the immigrants even get there. You don't need to wait on the market signal. Um, and I guess the general idea that Matsukuto suggests is the state can invest in really, really, really early research. So um, like the the state invested in like getting men on the moon with stuff like lasers, which are routinely now used in, um, in medicine. Um, the state routinely um, invested in like computers and in, in like miniaturization of computers. That in part was also helpful to like the modern computing technology. Um, the fundamental thesis of Matsukuto's book, and this is why I don't think it's that hard to get, is that the government made iPhone. <laughs> Every technology in the iPhone was created with state investment. Um, so I guess that would be the, the desirable part of it. There were huge, enormous failures in all of these countries. And I, I think democracy is one of the most important parts of both economic growth and political like success. Um, so I think that as a whole, they were pretty enormous failures, but I think that that part is desirable. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ed. I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks this, but it's been a great AMA and we've loved having you on. Uh, fantastic answers and to the people providing the questions, fantastic questions. They were all very interesting, uh, as were your answers. Oh, thanks. Uh, and mm. again, as I'm sure I'm not the only one saying this. We would love to have you on again at some point. Sure. Fantastic. I guess that, Thank you. I'll, I'll answer Dansk's question. What's, what Nordic model country is the best sounding language? It's clearly Finnish, okay? Because Finnish has a, a gender neutral third person pronoun. Everyone's a Han. There you go, there. You've got, you've got your answer. But again, yeah, wonderful AMA. Um, very grateful for having you on. Uh, it's been amazing having you uh willing to come on here so thank sure, you very I, much. i'm happy to come on you don't need to like kiss my feet or anything <laughs> no, it, uh, just, just incredibly grateful that um yeah that we have amas it's uh it's wonderful as people get to express their views and uh people who are interested get to listen sure i guess um i'm probably gonna head out and do something with my family um in a bit that's why i cut off i'm sorry um it's but fine. um I guess it, my shout out to everyone who is uh, who is still here. The, I really do recommend the book "Politics Is for Power" by Hirsch. Um, regardless of if you agree or disagree with my political views, um, I think it presents really compelling evidence that community organizing is a really effective way for for politics to become meaningful to people and for people to get engaged in politics and actually change, like electoral outcomes, for example, um, and actually rebuild trust. Um, so I think it's a really interesting book. Uh, "Politics Is for Power," <laughs> great book. Thank you very much. Um We'll have the have the uh, AMA up um, on our channel at some point. Um, if, if there's anything that is only like social media, anything like that that you would want us to to put in the description or in the video for you, um, maybe the YouTube channel, I guess. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, we'll definitely do that. Sure. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you for again. Thank you for coming. It's been amazing. Thanks for having me here, including spineless Tim, okay? Apparently, I was talking to his spine. Wasn't even in him anymore. <laughs> Tim's spine. I have many appendages. <laughs> many appendages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spines one and three are still there, but two is missing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Have a lovely afternoon, everyone. No worries, dude. Thank you, you again too. for coming. Have a wonderful day.